So it is March 9th, 2016. Uh, we're at the Royal York Hotel in Toronto. Um, I'm interviewing Patricia Dillon. My name is Eric Weidenhammer. Uh, so I guess we'll start with the basic questions. So uh, could you tell us your name and age? <laughs> I'm Patricia Dillon and I'm 63 years old. Where were you born? I was born here in Toronto. And what did your parents do? Uh, my mother, uh, well, I'm the oldest of five children, and basically once uh, she found out she was pregnant with me, that was the end of her career, and she was a stay-at-home mom, and my dad was in sales. What did he sell? Oh, he's different things over the years, but he ended up with a company called uh, Premium Forest Products, so it was uh, Doors. I see. Um, as a child, what did you do to pass the time? Well, I, um, I enjoyed swimming. I was very fortunate. My parents rented a cottage every summer for, for a month, and so I enjoyed swimming. Uh, one of the best memories I have as a child, uh, there were many, many children. We were on a street that was essentially a dead end, and uh, to pass the time in the summer, we'd get together and we would organize a, a performance of singing, dancing, and plays, and we raised money for the Star Fresh Air Fund. So that was a lot of fun and took up a lot of time in the summer. Other than that, you know, during the year it was school. Did you uh, have uh, an early interest in the world of science? Uh, I, yeah, well, early, high school. Certainly by, by high school I had an interest in science. I was uh, very fortunate. I lived in the east end of Toronto and I went to Malvern. And at the time I was in high school, there was uh, still the opportunity to skip a grade in high school. And uh, so we... Um, number of students uh, had that opportunity between grade 9 and what would have been grade 10. We went to summer school, we had to study Latin, French and mathematics and I went right into grade 11 and so was able to get more into the sciences earlier uh, in terms of my teenage years. <laughs> so where did you go to school and uh, what classes did you particularly like? Every time I went high school? Yeah. So I went to Malvern Collegiate, and uh, the, the sciences really were my focus. Uh, it was unfortunate that you had to make so many choices early in your high school career, so things like geography and history got dropped from my curriculum rather than uh, so I could pursue chemistry and biology and, and physics. How did you come to study geology at the University of Toronto? <laughs> well, that's a funny story because um, back in the time that I started university, which is was the 1970s, uh, you had got a big book, a calendar, of course, descriptions, and I knew I was going to take physics, chemistry, uh, math, and uh, biology or zoology as it was. But you had to have five courses, and flipping through the calendar, I saw geology, and I thought, well, that sounds like an interesting complementary course to my others, so uh, I gave it a try. How did you find your education at uh, the University of Toronto? Well, I wasn't as smart as I thought I was, and in first year I didn't uh, apply myself. I thought this was great fun, and um, I didn't do that well, but fortunately I passed on probation, and geology was my highest mark, and I took that as a sign that this is maybe a field I should stick with as I knuckle down, and then after that and, and developing the focus, I, I really really enjoyed the geology, I enjoyed all the courses, and I enjoyed the camaraderie of, of the smaller environment. At U of T, which is a huge school, uh, to be in a course like geology, we were able to develop deep friendships that have lasted for decades and decades. When did you join tech? Ah, so I was fortunate in 1972 to get my first job in the field working with Imperial uh, minerals and I did field work in Ontario and subsequently the next year I did field work in Nova Scotia and then when the year of my graduation Tech had acquired the Newfoundland zinc mine in Newfoundland and they were looking for geologists that had experience in carbonate geology and because I had worked in Nova Scotia around the Case River deposit I had that background and so I was hired uh, as I was graduating from U of T with my specialist geology degree. And so I started as a summer student in 1974 and went to Newfoundland. Do you remember anything uh, particular about your first day there? Well, not so much about my first day, but uh, my husband, Ted, 
had the interview after me for that summer job and uh, at that time Matthew Blacker who was the exploration manager um, when I rather aggressively pointed out that my fiance was the next interviewee he said do you think the two of you could work together and we were subsequently hired together as a field team and, and sent to Newfoundland and Ted was my field assistant so I remember that sort of early willingness to look at uh, really quite innovative hiring practices and we were able to work together so that that was a that's a wonderful memory for me and off we went to Newfoundland. What did you first work on at Tech? Well, it was the new as a summer student. It was at the Newfoundland zinc mine, so it was a field mapping project. We were uh, five teams of two, and we had uh, a very, very large concession to explore in and around the mine site, looking to extensions of the deposits. So it was great fun. Do you remember what sort of equipment you used at the time? Well. <laughs> Boots, hammer, uh, repex, uh, bug repellent, uh, compass, of course. We, we had air photos back then. There's no GPS, uh, topographic maps. So th that was the main equipment. And, of course, we had uh, various uh, testing materials for, for mineralization. I mean, the standard, basic field geological tools. Can you describe what the company was like in the period that you joined? It was a very exciting company to work for, very entrepreneurial. Uh, it was active across the, the country, Canada, all, all over. Uh, young group. Um, it was it was just, just amazing. I was the first, uh, I don't know if I was the first female geologist ever hired by Tech, but I was the only one at that time. And uh, I stayed working with Tech uh, through the summers for, for a number of of years uh, I subsequently went back to school and did a Bachelor of Education but even as a teacher high school teacher I had the summers off and so I continued to work with tech in the summers so I didn't actually go full-time with tech until 1979. Did you enjoy that field work uh, being in the outdoors? Yes I, that was that was the most exciting uh, part of it to be outdoors mind you the days trudging through the swamps weren't always the, the most fun, but uh, the excitement of the, of the hunt and then the discovery, especially when you, you came across outcrops with mineralization and then you were waiting for the sample results and, and putting together the puzzle of the geology to understand uh, the, the structures. It was, yeah, it was challenging, it was interesting, it was fun. How has the company changed uh, since you joined? Oh my goodness, uh, well, my career spanned almost 40 years, so there were tremendous uh, changes, including the shift of the head office from Toronto to Vancouver, all of the different uh, deposits and projects that were acquired and developed over the years, just at the, the merger with uh, Kaminko uh, many years later, the, the, just the, the expansion into uh, South America, the but the entrepreneurial spirit of the of the company never never seemed to to waver, especially under the leadership of, of Dr. Kevel Senior and subsequently Dr. Kevel Junior. So, how did you become interested in education and uh, advocacy? Ah, uh, so as I pointed out, I had a degree in in education. Uh, with Ted also being in the mining business, we decided very early on as a married couple to diversify our family skill set so that's why I went back to school to be a teacher but I only stayed teaching long enough to get my permanent teaching certificate so I always had an interest in education so in um, 1994 when Barry Simmons was a member of the board of directors at the PDAC he took over chair of the education committee and at that time he looked across the country for best practices in mineral education he identified a program that was being carried out in BC under the uh, leadership of Maureen Gutkavich and uh, the model for that education program was getting teachers to design resources uh, that took advantage of curriculum opportunities and helped teachers feel confident in, in delivering the subject matter because uh, most teachers don't necessarily have a geological background or, or much knowledge about the minerals industry so so that's how that all started um, so it was K 
came as a PVAC initiative that my boss was involved with at the time and knowing that I had a, an educational background and a geological background, it was a natural fit for me. Can you tell us about that decision to go back and get your teaching degree? Was that unusual for people in industry at the time? No, because I really wasn't in industry at the time. I had graduated in um, uh, May of 1974. Ted and I got married in October. We went to Europe for a honeymoon for five months and uh, we went back to work for Tech in the summer. And at that time I'd already decided to go at, to get at that time, it's not true now, uh, it was w one more year at school. Well, a year at school was eight months. September to April, I got another degree. I got the opportunity to work uh, professionally in a, in a totally different sector. So it was, um, it was a very conscious decision to, to diversify opportunity and skill sets. And in fact, a couple of times through my career when the industry went into great slumps, and we were in periods of layoffs. Uh, fortunately, I never got caught up in those periods, but I always felt I had my teaching uh, as something in my, my back pocket. It was also at a time where, as a woman in the industry, um, I felt that that was gonna continue to have opportunities as a woman in the industry, because there was a recognized recognition that we can bring, bring value. It didn't always have to be the brawn. But at the same time, um, in education, they were looking for more and more women role models in the fields of science and technology and engineering and mathematics, and I had that background. So I was pretty confident I would have had the opportunity to, to go back and uh, be successful in, in, as, as, a, as a teacher. Have you experienced the merger of two Canadian mining giants, uh, Tech and Cominco, in 2001? What was that? What was that experience like? What was the merger like? Well, I was, of course, from the the tech side of the merger. I knew many of uh, my colleagues in in Cominco. It it really uh, changed changed the company uh, quite a bit because it brought together the best of of the of, of both worlds. Uh, my feeling, you know, tech didn't. Cominco had the trail smelter, so they had that sort of side of the business, whereas we had been, you know, mine operators and explorationists. So it, 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 was, it was a wonderful marriage. And, and of course, Tech had had the interest in Cominco from the 1986 sale of the, um, of the shares from CN. So there had already always been a bit of a, a relationship and awareness. So when the actual merger took place, um, Always the integrations of, of systems and, and cultures uh, can be a bit challenging, but I think in, in that particular case, it was a lot smoother because of the long association prior to the actual integration. Have you traveled a great deal for your work? Uh, <laughs> a great regret, actually. Um, most of my travel with, with tech was in Canada other than the odd conference. We used to have our exploration conferences in different uh, locations around the world, but I never had the opportunity to, to work in the United States or work in South America. And of course, uh, tech expand, you know, had considerable operations in, in those countries and I never got that opportunity. I did do some traveling when I was president of the, the PDAC, but in terms of comparison with, with many of my peers who, who worked and traveled internationally, I had quite, quite a uh, less, less experience in that. And I think it was because of the nature of the way my job evolved as, as well. I didn't actually stay in the field of exploration geology for many, many years. I, I moved into what was sort of considered at the time an administrative geologist, so I worked with the legal side, the financial side, we had the Digimon Sulfite Syndicates, and so I was providing those kinds of, of services to, to those projects, rather than continuing to be out in the field, banging on the rocks, which would have. And, and of course, um, when I became a mother, um, I was in fact less interested in, in that kind of long-term travel or, or postings. 
You mentioned the sulfide syndicates. Could you tell me about that arrangement? So the Digimon sulfide syndicates were, were consortiums of companies that were brought together to actually take advantage of proprietary technology that had been developed by a subsidiary at Tech Digim Limited at, at the time. And um, so they were, they were international syndicates. I mean, the sulfide syndicate that represented companies from Germany and Japan and eventually from Otokumpo. And uh, it used this geophysical technology to identify prospective areas in Canada, conduct the airborne surveys, and then design follow-up programs for, for the anomalies. And, and the Digim Syndicate was the predecessor of the Sulfide Syndicate, and it was responsible for discovering the Montcalm deposit. So it was, it was quite, quite interesting at, at the time. It was a, a lot of the way exploration was being structured through the, you know, undertaking the, you know, identifying target areas, undertaking the geophysical surveys, and then, then doing the follow-up based on what you saw in the field. So, Forgive my ignorance, but what were the technologies involved? Airborne, airborne geophysics. Okay. Yeah. So starting out in the mining business in the late 70s, uh, you uh, would have witnessed the, the recent history of the modern environmental movement. How has the industry's relationship to the environmental movement changed over time? Well, um, first of all, we're very close to the environment by the, the nature of our work. And I, I, would, I would argue that, that geologists were probably some of the, some of the first environmentalists. Uh, they didn't want to leave their garbage or messes behind when going, you know, I mean, it's just terrible. So, um, but I think the, the general, um, the, the laws grew and changed. And I think the industry were, were early adopters and, and happy to, to raise the, the attention to environmental stewardship and, and responsibility. Um, so, so from my own experience, uh, um, I know that there is the issue of orphaned and abandoned mines. Uh, some of the issues are very, very complex from the point of view of, of um, what, what has happened historically. But I, I think now, uh, certainly in my experience and the organizations I've worked, there's the highest attention to environmental stewardship. So of particular interest to the, the history of Canadian metallurgy, of course, is the Kaminko smelter, which has a, a long uh, history of environmental controversy. How has Tech, uh, who has inherited this, this facility, uh, addressed some of these uh, long-standing issues? Well, I think, I think, um, I think always uh, the company has, has paid, it, paid attention uh, to the issues. I think the company has demonstrated it's very, very responsive in, in the case of, of spills, uh, being transparent in all of their activities to, to take responsibility, to initiate cleanup, to keep communities involved. Um, but you've got to remember, this was a hundred year uh, operation and, and just as, as safety rules and environment rules have changed over time, so, so the company has, has adjusted and responded. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the trail uh, smelter is using uh, a portion of its, its facilities to look at the whole recycling. Uh, opportunities, right? And I think it's providing a great service there and making investments to even improve um, the opportunity to recycle uh, more metals, particularly from the electronics industry. So, Can you tell us about the uh, industry's relationship to the Aboriginal community and, uh, and how the, that's changed over time? Well, as you know, the, the Canadian minerals industry is the largest employer of Aboriginal people in Canada, and um, we have more activities in close proximity to, to uh, Aboriginal communities. In fact, TAC was the leader in its uh, relationship with respect to the communities in and around the Red Dog Mine and the uh, NANA organization. So, I mean, TAC, I think, has, has shown that it's always been um, very respectful and, and taking uh, leadership. And that, of course, was in particular Kaminko initially prior to the merger. You also have the situation, and you can look to Sudbury and Highland Valley, 
where where the the Aboriginal community has not necessarily historically been uh, incorporated and engaged in the operations as much as would, would happen now. But those things are changing. I know for, for a fact that the tech has reaching out around all its coal operations and Highland Valley in particular um, to, to the Indigenous community. At Hemlo, we worked with uh, Pick River and the Pick Mobert First Nations looking at ensuring that there are benefits fl flowing to the, the community and, and negotiating participation agreements. So it's really, really changed. Um, and with the change in the, the regulatory framework, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, the, the focus on free prior and informed consent, uh, companies realize now that in, until you have the, the, the support and the willingness of the, the community to welcome you onto their land and to, to develop the resources in partnership, it's not going to happen. And I would say tech was a, was a leader in this, particularly because of their experience at, at Red Dog in the early, early days before this topic even was on the minds of many. Could you tell us about that, uh, the Red Dog Mine and uh, what you're referring to? Well, in, in the case of the Red Dog Mine, the, the, the local Indigenous people own the land on which the, the deposit uh, was discovered. So right from the very beginning, there were uh, conversations and commitments with respect to local hiring, local procurement uh, training. And uh, this was th th this this partnership approach um, was established because the the indigenous community the, the, they owned the land the Alaska natives owned owned the land so so it was very very clear whereas in other parts of Canada where when you're working on traditional territory and you have situations where traditional territories of a number of First Nations overlap it's it's a little bit more more complex but it's that it's that willingness to listen and to understand what are the priorities of the community and and, and this sharing the shared value the sharing of, of benefits but identifying what are the values and and what are considered benefits just because we think it's a benefit, you know, the local community is going to most likely have different ideas. Now, tech is one of the last Canadian-owned majors in mining and metallurgy, especially outside of uh, precious metals. Can you uh, give us your opinion on how foreign ownership has, uh, has affected geology and mining in Canada? Well, hmm. um, affected it... In, in the sense that, first of all, foreign ownership recognizes the value of investing in, in Canadian expertise, Canadian um, opportunities. So I think it's a recognition of our, of our excellence in, in mining and in mine management and mine, mine leadership. So um, it's, that's it. for me, that's a difficult question to, to address really. Hmm. They've been president of both uh, CIM um, and uh, the PDAC. Uh, in fact, I think you're the only person who's been president of both institutions. Mm -hmm. How do uh, the two institutions compare, and how do they how do they interrelate? Well, I was the only person who had been president of, of both organizations uh, up until this week, actually, when Bob Schaefer is. Uh, um, just taken over as, as president of the PDHC. Um, so the two great national organizations uh, with different, different mandates and, and, and focusing on really different segments of the industry, whereas PDHC is very much an advocacy group on behalf of really the early stage prospectors and developers, the, the CIM with its structure of technical societies and divisions focuses on um, you know, ensuring that professionals within the organization are kept up to date with best practices, latest developments in technologies. And PDAC does that too, but it's, it's in a different, it's in a different space. 
uh, CIM doesn't doesn't advocate the way that, for example, the Mining Association of Canada does in the the PDAC. Uh, both terrific organizations, both uh, national in scope, but uh, with with uh, a different a different um, strategic priorities. I think I would say. Can you tell us about the Mining Millennium Conference that you co-chaired in 2000? <laughs> well, that was that was a, a wonderful experience. The, the mining industry likes to see its resources deployed efficiently. And the, the question always was, well, why can't the PDAC and the CIM get together? Because at that time, the CIM conference would periodically rotate in Toronto, it would be held in May. PDAC is always in Toronto and it's always in March. So why to mark the millennium can't we see if we get together? The challenge is for both organizations, their annual conference is a major fundraising um, activity to support their their annual uh, priorities. So there was a lot of concern around if we bring it together, can we just demonstrate that we're going to be able to generate the kind of revenues that, that both, or, both organizations need. But there was a, a group of the willing to, to give it a try. We got the authorization of, of both boards uh, to give it a try. But the way we structured, structured it was, it wasn't a full integration of, of two conferences. We ended up structuring that sort of PDAC was the first few days of the week and CIM was sort of the second half of the week and then a number of the social events and the awards events were, were integrated in the middle of the week. Um, the challenge was it meant that if you wanted to be there for the whole time, it made for a seven day conference and that was exhausting. There were revenue implications for both organizations, but we were glad that we, we tried and that we, we, just, we were able to demonstrate to our, our constituents that we could be successful with bringing everything together, but it also did highlight um, the fact that they, they do have, well, whereas they do overlap in a number of areas, they also are quite separate in, in other areas. But we, it was, it was a, a wonderful event and I was glad we gave it a try. You headed the Toronto branch of CIM. Um, can you tell us what sort of work goes on in the in the branches of CIM? So the branches um, are are um, the leadership in the branches comes from the the local the the local area. So they know what the interests are of the of the professionals within that area. So. Uh, the Toronto branch would organize talks and events that would bring together the local mining community and we also had a very much a mandate of outreach to, to local students who were interested in, in the mining area. And of course, Toronto is, you know, world centre for, for mining, so it was one of the, the largest branches and uh, I was very honoured to be the first woman chair. What are some of the messages that you're trying to pass on to young people through the Mining Matters Initiative? So the Mining Matters Initiative, um, it, it, it has a number of, of pillars. Um, and, and our first mandate really was to focus on providing um, quality resources to teachers who are required to teach about rocks, minerals, and specifically earth processes and earth sciences, okay? We, we, at the time that Mining Matters was initiated, the, the goal was to provide uh, information about the industry so that people could make informed decisions in the future. And our original focus was the urban areas of Toronto and Ottawa. Of course, over the last 22 years, we've, we've expanded across the country. Now the messaging uh, is around the, uh, um, the idea is that if, when we're in, deal, in Aboriginal communities and working with Aboriginal youth, the message is the minerals industry provides, provides opportunities and wide variety of opportunities uh, right in, in your area, but also globally. Um, it's a technologically advanced, you know, safe, 
safe uh, profession to to work in uh, but to advance within it staying in school is is very very critical so so that's some of the messaging now it's it's around career awareness and back when we started mining matters within educational systems you must remember that education is provincially mandated so one size doesn't fit all um, the opportunity to teach about rocks minerals and mining is going to vary in different grades and different regions of the the country so we've had to adjust and adapt our resources depending on where where we are and the kinds of communities we're, we're going into but it was a, a number of years ago that that educational um, authorities recognize we they need to do a better job in helping students under where uh, become aware of career opportunities it's not just doctors dentists nurses and, and teachers there's there's a whole bunch of other options out there so so we've expanded into that career awareness as well so we um, we have a lot of fun with them because we we build off young people's natural interest in the sparkly bits and pebbles and rocks and their their inherent um, curiosity so how and when did that project start well we started in 1994 um, and we we produced and tested our first resources in 94 uh, and we became a charitable organization in 97 and I've uh, been very fortunate as I mentioned Barry Simmons who started it uh, under the auspices of the PDAC Education Committee. He was a tech employee at the time, and tech has been a tremendous supporter of the initiative through uh, not only the t time Barry and I spent into it throughout our day-to-day, -day, but also financially. Tech made its offices available for kit production. It, it helped us in providing resources for the kits and as have many, many other companies. And we're, we're so proud of the fact that we, we now can attract funding from foundations, individuals, corporations, governments, and uh, through PDAC membership, we get donations from, from many of their members around the globe to support the advancement of minerals education generally. How has your work with the PDAC changed over time? Uh, well, so with PDAC, I started initially through the committee structure. So I was working on committees. I worked on a number of committees. I ended up chairing the communications committee for a while. And then um, when I was approached to ask if I would uh, allow my name to, to be considered for president, um, I didn't shy away from that. I didn't seek it out. But when I was asked, I thought, well, yeah, give it a shot. I had the support of tech uh, to go forward with that. And um, so then I moved into the role of president. And now as uh, past president, we're, I'm sort of in an emeritus role in as much that I can represent past presidents on, like I'm on the governance and nominating committee and of course I continue to to have mining matters so so it's 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 run the whole gambit but still very much involved. Can you tell us about your role in the minerals and metals industry sector study steering committee? So <laughs> there is good there is a meeting in Toronto um, that was being con con convened at that time by an organization called MITAC which was the Mining Industry Tra Training and Adjustment Council. Uh, and they were looking to see how they could evolve to meet the, meet the needs uh, better of, of, of industry. So that meeting included representatives of, of unions, associations, and corporations. And it was being held here in Toronto at an apartment uh, airport hotel. So um, because I had been involved with CIM, because I had been involved with PDAC, and because I also was employed by TAC, uh, I got asked to go to that meeting and, and wear all those different hats. So just what does this group want to do, what's going on, and then to report back to the various organizations. So at that time, they were, they were looking for people to, to chair, to chair a study 
the set, the the, uh, the study that you referred to, and uh, I got approached again. I'm um, I don't know if you could tell, but I'm one of those people that when invited to speak to speak or offer an opinion, I, I don't sort of shy away from it. And uh, so they asked me if I would be involved representing industry uh, because of the many hats I could wear as a co-chair of that committee and then my other co-chair at that time represented the educational institutions and then we were working with this group. And that was the seminal study that first started um, really identifying and, and putting numbers around what the HR challenges are, were going to be in, in the mining industry going forward. And then subsequently, as a result of that study, the organization evolved into the Mining Industry Human Resources Sector Council. And I'm currently past chair of that organization. And we're doing a tremendous amount of work in uh, gender equity, outreach to Aboriginal uh, communities through our Mining Essentials program. But we provide the labor market intelligence for the mining industry uh, across this country on, on what, what are the needs and where are they going to come from and where are there opportunities to meet the human resources needs in the, in the, in the industry. So very exciting work. And you're now teaching at a, a business school, is that right? Yes. Um, about uh, five years ago, Richard Ross, who used to be the uh, CEO of Inmat, he had retired at the time, he was approached by CIM to consider developing um, a leadership um, educational program after CIM had assessed there really wasn't anything currently in, in the academic environment that supported um, developing leaders uh, for, for the mining industry. So he um, started uh, developing the Global Mining Management Program. And uh, after the first year, he uh, approached me. It had come to light that I, had a, I was also retired at that time. And I had a background in education and, and broad experience in the mining industry. And so we started um, developing more of the courses and there are currently uh, five courses in, in the program. One at the uh, first year level of MBA, which is like a mining 101, which, which helps students because not all the students come from mining backgrounds. So that's sort of their mining 101 orientation to the industry. And then in second year, there's uh, four courses. There's value creation in the mining industry. There's financial fundamentals in the mining industry. I teach a course called Towards Sustainable Mining. And the fourth course is Managing Mining Companies. So I've, um, I'm in the middle of my fourth year uh, teaching that course. But teaching is, is a bit of a misnomer here because we bring in industry subject experts to speak to the students. So I'm a little bit more of the administrator, organizer, identify the, um, the key subject matter experts. And, and last night, as a matter of fact, at our class, uh, we were exposing the students to Indigenous perspectives on the mining industry in Canada. And we brought in three Indigenous leaders from First Nations and the student students had the opportunity to explore the topic of free prior informed con consent, the effectiveness of IBAs, the concerns in First Nations community with respect to mineral development. So it's very, very exciting. Have you ever worked in a particularly dysfunctional job or organization? Actually, no. Um, it's, it's very interesting because um, yeah, no, the answer, is, the answer is no. I mean, I've worked in organizations or I've worked with groups or I've worked with committees that have had challenging tasks and, and had evolving demands and expectations, but, but dysfunctional, no. Um, and I think sometimes that it's how you approach people, it's how you engage people, it's how you bring people around having a, a common goal. Now, we have had some difficult situations to deal with and some really odd situations, but, but in terms of, of an entire organization being dysfunctional, no. What are some of the challenges that you face? The, the challenges, 
while being being so passionate about the mining industry, not having a, a, enough time in the day to maybe be involved with as, as many things as, as you'd like to. I think sometimes um, making a, a misstep in, in, in identifying somebody to maybe work on a particular project or on a, a committee who doesn't maybe have the same kind of commitment or passion or, and, or necessarily uh, background. So I think that that sometimes can be a challenge. What was the most difficult project that you worked on? Difficult project. Well, I'd have to say fundraising is difficult, <laughs> generally. Um, and, and, and it's hard. I mean, when you run a charitable organization and, for example, we're in a, a downturn right now in our industry and, and I, I believe in the value of what we're doing, for example, at Mining Matters and, and it's hard sometimes to go out there and, and have people say, you know, just really I can't, you know, support you right now or, or I don't doesn't happen often, but some people shift their, their priorities and the kinds of things they want to support, which is sometimes hard to hear. So what's your, what's your fondest memory that relates to your work? Oh, wow. Fondest memory. I think when I, I had the support of tech senior management to represent the organization and in international uh, fora uh, at the time of the um, global mining initiative, uh, I had um, I had the opportunity to, to go to London and uh, represent the company and and uh, yeah, knowing that somebody had that much faith and support in you. The other um, the other time in which I, I felt very very honored was after the, 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 the difficult time that tech went through, through the down, downturn, and um, we, we went through a, a layoff. We laid off of 13% of our employee and contractor base at that time. And then very quickly through Don Lindsay's 13-point plan, uh, the, the company was, was back on track. The debt issues had been resolved. The, the, um, the, attracted the, the Chinese investment and everything was great. And the mines ministers wanted to hear the story. How did it happen that that tech in such a short period of time with, with terrific senior management, um, you know, what was the sequence of events that, that led to us being in that very, very difficult situation? And I, I got selected to be the person to go to the mines ministers uh, to, to tell that story. Um, that was a, an incredible opportunity, again, because of the, the support and the faith that the senior management had in, in my ability to be effective in that environment and to, to, to deliver the story. What sorts of social activities have you in, have been involved with uh, at work or after work with coworkers? At work or after work with coworkers? Well, at Mining Matters, we organize a hockey tournament every year. Um, I can remember back in the day when Tech rented the Maple Leaf Gardens to have the Tech versus uh, Prospectors golf uh, hockey tournament, uh, skating at, at Maple Leaf Gardens with, with Dr. Keevil. I remember that uh, clearly. Um, and, and when I was in Vancouver, um, Tech would order, organize um, events where we'd go up Grouse Mountain uh, to, to ski or snowshoe. I think, um, I think one of the, the really exciting times was when Tech produced all the metal for the 2010 uh, Olympic medals and we brought in our excellence award winners from around the country and then we got to uh, mix and match from from all over the world to to go and and witness Olympic events uh, proudly uh, aware of the fact that our medal from our minds all over the world was in those those beautiful uh, Olympic medals so that was really really exciting 
um, in your line of work, I, I guess geology, are there any particular social problems uh, that you've witnessed over time? Uh, drug abuse, uh, infidelity, these sorts of things? Um, I didn't see it. Um, but, and, and, and a, a, a question that often comes up as a, as a, a woman, you know, in, in the mining industry through the 70s and 80s was the uh, difficulty with, with respect to, um, you know, gender equality. Um, at the time I was first hired with tech, we had a mine manager at our Lumac mine, which was an underground gold mine, and he was very much old school. And at that time, even though I was an employee of tech, I would not have been allowed to go underground because I was a woman. But that mine manager moved on, and I got underground at Lumac. Um, so, you know, I am aware of the fact that, that a number of women had, had difficulties in the industry in terms of, of uh, the, the difficult social issues. Again, my infield career was, was very early on before, uh, for example, um, we didn't work as closely at that time with, with our Indigenous neighbours and, and you do hear of, of some of the difficulties in those um, communities. Um, here at the convention, of course, you know, a couple of times you you would maybe indulge a little bit too much in alcohol, but I was never approached um, in, ever about, you know, drugs or any anything like that. Maybe because people could tell I wouldn't be interested anyway and just go running the other, other way. How uh, present or absent have uh, other women been in your workplace over time? Has that changed? Oh, yeah, it's, that's changed uh, tremendously. And um, I'm a I'm a great advocate uh, for for women. I as as you know from my background, I've been the first woman or the second woman in, in a number of, of situations. But once I get in there, I'm a great advocate for for the the skills and the talents of women, and will bring them in. So, for example, when I was chair of the the CIM Toronto branch, or before I became even chair of the Toronto branch, there was one other woman involved at that time, Elizabeth Gardner, who worked with the Ontario Mining Association. But through the course of my involvement in, in tenure, I got a lot more women involved. And so, so it, has, it has changed, it's far, from, far from ideal. But women, I think, are being more supportive of women and generally, I think, uh, with the new generation of young men coming up who got more experience uh, dealing with women as equals through their educational environment. Uh, I, think that, I think that's happening. I think the fathers of daughters are a lot more sensitive to supporting their, their daughters in, in their careers uh, and achievements in, in more male-dominated uh, roles, but we've still got a long way to go, but we've all got a role to play, and times are changing, and some of the old boys, they're, they're fading into the woodwork, and, and, but I've always believed, and I know a number of my, my uh, colleagues wouldn't necessarily agree, I always believed in my heart of hearts that if you got in, and you did a good job, and you maybe weren't too aggressive. I mean, you were you were present. You were forceful. You you sit at the table. You don't sit back. I I do believe that that men and other women will will recognize our abilities and and our willingness and and capability to to contribute effectively. How is the field of geology in general uh, doing in Canada compared to to when you started? Well, it's right back where I started. I, the year I, the year I graduated, there there were so few jobs, and we're now in a situation where there are so few jobs. It's the, it's it's the the frequency and the you can count on the cycles, and we're in a down cycle, and it's tough right now. I mean, I've got students at the Schuler School of Business, and they're saying, well, Pat, you know, where am, where am I going to get a job? And I'm going to say, hey, you know, we're at the bottom of the down cycle. Build your networks. Uh, learn about the industry, get connected, stay involved in things, and it, it's going to turn around. So it was, it was very difficult in, in 72, 
when I was a second year student, only three of us in, in my class, and that was the class of engineers and the class of geologists, got summer jobs. So um, it ebbs and flows with, with the cycles, unfortunately, the commodity cycles. Who's been your greatest mentor or uh, who has had the greatest impact on your career? The, the man who hired me at Tech, Matthew Blacka. And, and, and at the time, his, his uh, boss, uh, John May, um, they, they made sure that I had opportunities always uh, to participate. They always introduced me. They always showed that they had uh, confidence in my perspective and my ability. Even though I was young and didn't have a lot of experience, I remember very well uh, being in a sulfide syndicate meeting as it was and the meeting was all over and um, we were well, caucusing after and and I said to, to John at the time I said you know one of the things I didn't understand and I laid out my question and he looked at me he says Pat he says I will guarantee you if there was something you didn't understand in that meeting uh, probably 50% of the other people in that meeting didn't understand it as well. Please do not ever hesitate to ask the question. Feel free. And as a result, I've, I've never been afraid of asking a question. I've never believed that that I would be ridiculed. And so, so that support, that um, confidence in putting me in, in situations, uh, believing in my ability, letting me stumble, Letting me stumble, I can be, I remember a number of times when, when I was told that, that perhaps I had strayed a little bit this way or the other, um, but it was always done in a, a supportive and a constructive way. And so I would say Matthew Black and I worked with him for, for many, many, many years at Tech. And so I, I had no women mentors. Um, so... And I think that's going to be true for, for most women in this industry for a while. Uh, men are going to be very, very important uh, mentors. We need women as role models, it's true, but most of the mentoring is going to come from men. What are the most important lessons that you've learned in life? Uh, when opportunity knocks, even if you're feeling unsure, put your say yes. Um, I can remember when I was asked, if I would consider running to be president of the PDAC, uh, when I was approached to be president of the CIM, when I was asked if I would be an ambassador for Keep Mining in Canada, when I was approached and asked to be a co-chair of a committee, uh, I always thought, well, you know, this opportunity is coming my way for, for, for a reason and don't, don't run the other way. Uh, trust in the future. Even when it's uncertain, uh, when even when you maybe can't see how things are, are going to play out, uh, have confidence in your ability and have confidence in the people around you who who care and want to see you see you succeed. Most people want to see people succeed. There are a few out there that want to whack you down, but generally that's not the case. What are you proudest of? Oh, after my children and my relationship with my husband, uh, so many things. But I'd have to say Mining Matters, the, the fact that it's attracted um, support from so many individuals, so many corporations uh, nationally, um, I, I, over so many years. It's been sustained over so many years. Uh, I would have to say that's something that I'm, I'm very, very proud of as, as an accomplishment. Um, the, the chance to, ha to have had my entire career uh, with a company such as Tech, I mean, that, that's been an incredible. Um, and, and the opportunities, you know, I also, um, I also did a comment to the University of Toronto uh, at, at the time Pierre Lasson made his transformative gift to reestablish mining engineering. And that went right to Dr. Keevil to say, 
yes, we'd like Pat to be involved in this project. It was it was a, a bit of a startup, not in terms of like a corporate startup, but still an educational program startup. And and for two years, uh, tech su supported me while I was not present at tech, but actually at an educational institution. I mean, that was um, an amazing opportunity. The fact that after we went through a terrible downturn and I came off that secondment, um, I continue to be supported in my role here in Toronto. The fact that I was invited at the time they were considering putting together the transition team had the INCO uh, acquisition been successful. I mean, I was tremendously honored by that. The fact that in the latter stage of my career, I had the opportunity to move to head office and take on new roles. The support I had to work with the Mining Association of Canada through the early development and growth of the Towards Sustainable Mining Initiative, which is now, uh, you know, a national, incredible program that is driving performance improvements in our industry. So, so much really. And your biggest contribution to the field of uh, mining and geology? I don't know. I don't know. I hope, I hope there's been a contribution. Um, I hope that a number of, of uh, young, young people that I've interacted with over the year have seen and realized opportunity and success in the industry uh, because of something I said or encouragement I provided uh, when I was president of CIM, I was very much student student focused. Um, so I I hope that that's I I hope that that's what the contribution has been. Anything else you'd like to add? It's a great industry, had a wonderful run, uh, and I'm very pleased even as a retiree that I've been able to stay involved through the. Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. Um, I, I love the fact that the industry through the PDC, through the CIM, and through the Hall of Fame and, and the Mining Association of Canada, we recognize excellence in, in our industry and we use that as a way to tell our story more broadly uh, to Canadians and internationally about uh, how the industry has evolved and grows and will continue to do so. I love the collaboration I see within the industry on issues that are of critical importance to performance, particularly safety performance. Um, and I, I, I really am impressed with all the, the people I've met in, in my career. It's, it's, a, it's a small family. Well, thank you for your time, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you.